always assume a 3% conversion rate with anything, even your friends and family. If you have a thousand people that you think you can count on, you're talking about 30 people that are actually gonna pull the trigger and give you the credit card information when you end up buying. You don't wanna rely on the friends and family model for crowdfunding, it's just not a good way to do it. What you wanna rely on is an email list. They say that laughter is the best medicine. For Colin McIntosh, it's also been a pretty good business strategy. After a couple of fits and starts in business, Colin found himself with no job, but quite a few domain names in his possession, all of which were pun-based. So he cycled through what he owned and formed a plan to build a company in a disruptable industry where he could make a splash and earn some market share. What he landed on was Sheets and Giggles, a direct-to-consumer bedsheets company with a social good component that became the most successful bedsheets company to launch on the crowdfunding site Indiegogo. Since then, Sheets and Giggles has grown to millions of dollars in sales. And on this episode of Up Next in Commerce, Colin gives the behind the scenes story of building Sheets and Giggles, including how he worked backward to build an email list that led to an unprecedented 45% conversion rate. Plus, Colin dives into the pros and cons of selling on Amazon and gives an exclusive preview of some of the ad copy he's working on to bring more humor to the Sheets and Giggles campaigns across channels. Enjoy this episode. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Respond quickly to changing customer needs with flexible e-commerce connected to marketing, sales, and service. Deliver intelligent commerce experiences your customers can trust across every channel. Together, we're ready for what's next in commerce. Learn more at salesforce.com slash commerce. Hey listeners, it's Stephanie. Before we dive into the episode, I want to let you in on a little secret. Did you know that Mission has the number one e-commerce newsletter? It's amazing. It has really good news and insights and case studies that you will not find anywhere else. So go subscribe, mission.org slash up next in commerce. All right, on to the show. Hey everyone, this is Stephanie Postles, co-founder of mission.org and your host of Up Next in Commerce. Welcome back. Our guest today is Colin McIntosh, the founder and CEO of Sheets and Giggles. Colin, how's it going? Pretty good. Thanks so much for having me today. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I was very nervous about messing that name up. I'm sure you get that a lot. (laughs) Uh, Macintosh, Macintosh, yeah. The, oh, I meant your company is, name. <laughs> oh, the Sheets and Giggles. Yeah, no, of course. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I feel like I've gotten so used to it now. I don't even register it anymore. Um, but yeah, you can call it S and G for short, so that way you're not laughing every time. There you go. I like it. So before the show started, we are going a little bit through your background, which I think people would like to hear before we get into Sheets and Giggles. So I'd love for you to kind of start there. Of you know, how did you come to founding Sheets and Giggle, Giggles? What came before that? Uh, well, a lot came before. It depends on how far back you want to go. I, I uh, graduated from Emory University's uh, business school back in 2012. And I started my career at the world's largest hedge fund in Connecticut, a place called Bridgewater Associates. Mm-hmm. And uh, the guy, the founder there, a guy named Ray Dalio, is pretty famous nowadays. Yes. I got fired in about five months. Uh, which was great being 22 and losing your first job uh, in a strange state that you don't know anybody in. Oh, no. Uh, and what happened? Then, well, well, I was terrible at my job. So Five you know, months that is was, not uh, enough time. How do they even know? <laughs> no, I, it, Bridgewater is usually, uh, they're famous for like two months or two years. Uh, okay. And so I, I kind of had a weird little in-between stay where like after two months, we were all pretty sure it wasn't going to work out. But like they were like, ah, this should work out. And they didn't want to really pull the plug and then eventually I remember they were arguing in front of me one day about uh, I'll never forget this they were like re-interviewing me for a different role inside of the company and that's how they do it right you lose your box quote unquote and then they try to find you a new box before they totally get rid of you um, because they think you're like a culture fit right yep. they were arguing in front of me I'll never forget these two guys the two managers they were, one said you know I think Colin is a six for this role and the other manager says, well, I think he's more like a seven and I think we should hire him into it. And they're arguing six, seven, six, seven out of 10. And then the arbiter goes, look, guys, he can't get hired into the role if he's not a seven. If he's a six, we can't make, give him the offer. Okay. And then they agree, okay, he's a six and a half and we'll need to have another meeting on it. And I, and I remember I raised my hand and I go, guys, let me do this. Today's going to be my last day at Bridgewater. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I just couldn't deal with that type of like, 
Yeah, raiding you. It was, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. And so that was uh, my first job experience. And from there, I became a recruiter, a uh, third party agency recruiting for banks and hedge funds and startups. Um, that's where I got into technology and startups and software. Uh, taught myself a lot about uh, software development and uh, software engineering and ended up hiring a bunch of different engineers at a bunch of different companies. And I ended up hiring myself at one of my clients in Seattle in a really interesting B2B software space called application virtualization, uh, which is really hot in 2014, still pretty hot. And I ended up moving out to Seattle. Uh, and then about a year and a half later, I got an opportunity at a company that I helped co-found with some friends uh, called Revelar, which was a wearable tech product that got into Techstars, which is, for those listening, a really famous worldwide accelerator for startups. They give you $100,000 for 6% of your company and put you in a room with nine other companies for three months and give you all the training resources, connections, and mentorship that you could possibly need. And so I dropped everything I was doing in Seattle, drove 19 hours down to Denver on a week's notice and uh, became a Coloradan about five years ago. And that company ended up working there for about two and a half years. We all got laid off at 1 p.m. on a Sunday as startups unfortunately go. And it was really sad. We had raised millions of dollars and were in Target and Brookstone and HSN, QVC deals, T-Mobile stores. But that product unfortunately didn't have all the legs that we thought it did. Mm -hmm. And three weeks after I got laid off, um, incorporated Sheets and Giggles. And now it's been three years since that date. And it is now the longest I've ever worked anywhere in my career. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, so what is Sheets and Giggles? And how did you have the idea to start it? Well, for anyone who hasn't heard of us, it's okay. Although I will hold it against you. Um, <laughs> very, we, rude. <laughs> uh, <laughs> very rude. Uh, we sell bed sheets that are sustainable and they're made out of a material called Lyocell, which is made from eucalyptus trees. And so if you, you know, Google or Amazon eucalyptus sheets were generally the first result. Um, Lyle cell sheets is another query we rank high for. Um, and what our sheets do is they actually save up to 96% of the water that cotton sheets do uh, use, which is about a thousand gallon reduction. And then they also save energy. They use no pesticides, no insecticides, whereas cotton can use 16 to 24% of the world's insecticides just by itself as a crop. They also biodegrade faster than cotton. They're hypoallergenic, they're zero static, and they're naturally softer and more cooling. So if you're a hot sleeper, they're the best possible material the eucalyptus lyocell cell is for hot sleepers. And so it's a really wonderful product. Uh, we began manufacturing it about two and a half years ago, and we now have shipped tens of thousands of orders. We've raised a couple million dollars in capital, although uh, we are mostly revenue funded and we grow according to our revenue. And we are just loving life right now. We're a very socially conscious company and it's really wonderful to be able to have fun, do good and, and make money at the same time. That's great. So with your company, did you see an opportunity in the market from doing research or did you just wake up one night sweaty like, oh, I need to build better sheets. This is not right. Like how did <laughs> that a question. happen? <laughs> so, so whenever I hear founder interviews from like Brooklyn and or like other uh, you know, bed sheets companies, and I, and I hate to throw Brooklyn under the bus. They're a great company, Sorry, and Brooklyn. I really respect. No, I re I really respect <laughs> what they built. They you know they got like a hundred million dollars in trailing twelve months revenue. Like they're yeah, one great. wonderful company, right? But their <laughs> their co-founders go on these these podcasts, and they're like, oh, we were staying in these hotel sheets, and we were like, oh, they're so lovely, and then we found out how expensive they were, and we were like, there had to be a better way. <laughs> Nobody starts a company because they stayed at a hotel, like they like. <laughs> They saw a really good business model. They found a manufacturer who would make really good, uh, you know, products for them at, a, at an affordable price so they could resell at a higher price. And they went from there. And that's great. And they should be proud of that. And so that's sort of uh, more or less what happened with S&G, where it was actually a business model play first. And I'm a big, like a big, big advocate of sustainability and, and climate change is one of my hot buttons. I've always had a bleeding heart. I've, I've worked at startups trying to end animal euthanasia. I, my last startup, the wearable tech startup I talked about, we were trying to fight sexual assault and violence. We actually sent out 60,000 emergency alerts, saved a bunch of lives, which is really a wonderful, wonderful thing that, uh, that the company did. But, you know, this company, I really wanted to have a sustainability mission. And so I kind of sat down and I wrote out my perfect business model uh, with a sustainability mission. This is a true story. I looked at all the domains that I owned 
And I own sheetsgiggles.com because I thought it'd be a funny name for a bedsheets company. I have a lot of pun-based domains that I own. What's and, some other ones uh, I want to hear? Any <laughs> others come to mind? <laughs> uh, I've got uh, a few really good ones. Bodcast.com, B-O-D-C-A-S-T-S.com. I love that. I would love to do like um, podcast for exercise where you don't have to watch YouTube videos uh, and you yep. can just like have a platform for uh, exercise physiologists and personal trainers to like do listening only routines. I also own uh, sunglasseshalffull.com for a sunglass company, giraffecaraffe.com for carafes in the shape of giraffes. Uh, <laughs> I own uh, workfromrome.com, why work from home when you can work from Rome. That's a uh, travel uh, company for remote work. I, I buy a lot of domains. So many right companies here. to start. Yeah. So little time. <laughs> <laughs> Roman Hem- Roman Hemper is probably my favorite one that I'll probably start one day. CBD company, um, and my nephew's Good. name is Roman, so he'll be my my little CBD Perfect. mascot. Um, yeah. <laughs> my sister will love that. Yeah, um, I think she will. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So to answer your question, a lot of them, and uh, and so I owned SheetsGiggles.com. I thought does betting fit my criteria, and it fit it perfectly. Twelve billion dollar U.S. market, growing ten percent year over year. Highly fragmented. The top five players only own about 27% of the market. Um, and it wasn't fully online at that point. It was still mostly physical retail. And so I kind of just put my head down and I, I fell in love with this brand. And that, that was the other thing is I just fell in love with the idea of a funny brand in a very boring space, especially if it's a sustainable premium product and you can still do a funny brand. That's a really hard tightrope to walk. And I really fell in love with like the branding challenge. And that was kind of when I put my head down in October 2017. I, I created a brand identity map for this pun-based betting empire is what I would call it to people. And, you know, me and a couple contractors just designed uh, a logo and I built my own website, wrote every single word of copy myself, would stay up till four in the morning writing, wake up at 8 a.m., start writing again, and just totally fell in love with this weird little company that I was creating in my bed in my underwear. And in May 2018, we did our crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo, raised $284,000 crowdfunded. Love those crowdfunders and have a very special relationship with the thousands of people who brought the company to life. And it's all been history since there. That's really fun. How did you, like, what was your experience on Indiegogo? How did you get found? Because a lot a lot of times on those crowdfunding platforms, it seems like there's so much noise nowadays. Like in the early days, it was probably yeah. easy to get found. Now it's like, oh my gosh, if I put something up there, there's like thousands of other people trying to raise money for something. Like how did you make sure that people found your potential product? Yeah, absolutely. And even in 2018, it was still uh, a pretty uh, difficult task, right? There were still thousands of projects being launched every every single day. 2013, 2014 would have been prime time to do a crowdfunding campaign. That was actually when, fun fact, I'm going to brag a little bit, Brooklinen did their Kickstarter in 2013 or 2014, and they did $236,000. We did ours in 2018, $284,000. So, hey, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, But so basically, there's a few hacks, right, for crowdfunding campaigns. So if any, anyone out there thinking about doing a crowdfunding campaign, Generally speaking, you want to do a few things. First and foremost, you want to set a goal that you can hit on day one because their algorithms reward percentage of goals hit in a, in a period of time. They don't reward dollars raised. You don't want to go too low because then you've set expectations for people that like, wow, you've blown away your goal and now I expect the world from this company. But you don't want to go too high either and have a goal that takes you the full 30 days to hit because then you won't trend. So for us, for example, internally, we wanted to do $100,000. Externally, we set our goal as $50,000. And we thought that we could hit that in a couple days uh, based on our preparation. So the second thing you want to do in order to come out of the noise is prepare. So a lot of people, it's kind of sad. I see them launch a crowdfunding idea for something that maybe is a really cool idea or cool project, but they don't do any preparation whatsoever. And they don't stop to think that even if they have a thousand Facebook friends and 30 friends and family and, you know, uh, 500 connections on LinkedIn and whatever it is, you just got to always assume a 3% conversion rate with anything. Right. Mm -hmm. And so even your friends and family. And so if you have a thousand people that you think you can count on, you're talking about 30 people that are actually going to pull the trigger and give you the credit card information when you end up buying. So you don't want to rely on the friends and family model for crowdfunding. It's just not a good way to do it. What you want to rely on is an email list. And I get asked all the time, where do you find your email list? Do you buy it? What do you, do you build it? And the answer is you build it. You want to build it and get people to give you their emails who are interested, qualified leads, who are interested in buying into the brand that you're building. 
And so what we did was we worked backwards from our goal of $100,000. We said, okay, $100,000 in 30 days. Generally speaking with the crowdfunding math, you want to make 30% of that on day one. That's just the way the crowdfunding works. Big boost in the beginning, plateau in the middle, boost at the end. And so you want $30,000 on day one. We knew our sheets were going to cost $70 on average, which was a really low price. I really underpriced them. And, uh, and we knew our average order was probably going to be 1.5 units, so $100 average order value. And if $30,000 on day one at $100 average order value is the goal, that means we need 300 customers on day one. If an email list converts at 3%, then that means that we need 10,000 emails in order to get 300 customers on day one. And that became our singular focus, singular goal from February through April of 2018 was gathering those 10,000 emails, doing it at an affordable price that would end up translating into a low cost of acquisition. And we ended up spending about $9,000 to gather about 11,000 emails converted at about a 45% rate, which is was really unheard of. That was the first time That's I was really ever high. very, very, yeah, I was very, very excited and, and confident that the crowdfunding campaign was going to go well when we saw the 45% email capture rate. And we ended up converting at four and a half percent on our email list on day one. And we had a $45,000 day one, just like clockwork. That's awesome. I like the idea of working backwards. I think enough people don't think of like, what do I want my end result to be? And how do I make sure to get there? And like you said, they rely on, oh, I have enough friends who will buy, which I've also experienced does not work. Friends and family can only go so far. Yeah. Yeah, People forget people get busy. They have busy mornings. They forget like you need like a big boost all at once to come out of the noise on crowdfunding. And so we ended up being the number two trending topic on, on Indiegogo. That's, that's awesome. So how did you go about building your email list? Because acquiring emails for the price that you did is very good. Conversions are very good. I mean, you can get a ton of emails these days, but a lot of them probably wouldn't be qualified if you don't do it the right way. So what kind of tactics did you use to get good emails who are qualified buyers to make sure that they actually ended up converting when you launched? So that's a great question. Uh, First and foremost, uh, if you're going to do a crowdfunding campaign, I would recommend hiring a digital agency that specializes in crowdfunding. But I would be very careful about whom because there's a ton of sharks and predators in this industry who will take you know, your $2,000 setup fee and they'll promise you the moon, right? There is one agency I recommend, my buddy, Will Russell. He's the man, Russell Marketing in New York. And uh, I trust him with my life. So I hired Will. I had known him tangentially through the last place I worked at. And uh, he basically flew out the boulder. We sat down, we whiteboarded things out in February, 2018 about, you know, our plan for the crowdfunding campaign. And basically the, the method was he had these emails from past campaigns that were early adopters, right? They're people who had backed Kickstarter campaigns before. And you can get lists like that in other places. Mm-hmm. Then you be- begin to build one, two, and 3% lookalike audiences on Facebook. Um, from those lists, uh, you're able to advertise to other people who are likely early adopters. You build a landing page. We use Kickoff Labs as the software for our landing pages that hooked into our Google Analytics. We did a photo shoot all in for $500 with me and all my best friends in Denver, Colorado. We were smoking cigars, drinking whiskey, having fun in bed, playing with dogs, eating pizza. Basically, whatever makes us laugh is what we put on camera. And so that was what we did in February 2018. We built those landing pages and that content with our first photo shoots. um, And all the copy we wrote was just coming from my two fingers or 10. And then uh, we just basically asked people, hey, do you want to lock into the best price you're ever going to get on the best bed sheets you're ever going to feel? And we had three core value propositions for any crowdfunding campaign. You generally need three core differentiation propositions. One was that it's literally softer and cooler than cotton. And I led with that because I think that people are selfish and won't buy a sustainable product if it's not better than the unsustainable version. Value prop number two was that it was sustainable. And value prop number three was that because I knew how all these retailers worked and I know the margin share that Bed Bath & Beyond takes from this category, which is about 40%, the price that you're paying is going to be dramatically lower than the price you pay for comparable luxury, sustainable options in store. And those were our three value props and it really resonated. That's great. So what does your customer acquisition strategy look like now that's different than maybe what you did with Indiegogo? Now, I mean, now I have a in-house marketing team, uh, four-person team. They're they're absolutely wonderful. Uh, Sarah, our VP of marketing, is a total genius. And she is someone who on the performance marketing side, I think, is unmatched. And I basically give her, I'll be completely honest, I give her free reign at this stage. 
because a, fo- a founder skill set is fundamentally different than a CEO skill set. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing my best to transition from founder to CEO. And part of that is not micromanaging and frankly, being okay with a much more boring job of facilitating, supporting, financing, and managing yep. versus being the, being the creative, being the brand voice, being the copywriter, being the photographer and the videographer and the Facebook uh, data analyzer and the Amazon ad <laughs> uh, creator. Like I, I can't do that anymore because it just doesn't scale. And it's also a good way to get talented people to leave when they feel like they're being micromanaged. So in terms of our actual, actual strategies, uh, I basically, it's all direct to consumer on our website, sheetsgiggles.com uh, and Amazon. And we've got core channels of Facebook, Instagram, Google, and Amazon as our digital spend. We do some podcast advertising. So definitely get in touch about that. Um, and we also do radio advertising on Colorado Public Radio and a few other stations. And then we've tried direct mail. We've tried a few other funky things. Nothing has the ROAS that digital tends to have. In terms of email strategy nowadays, we actually don't email people nearly that as often as we used to. Mm-hmm. In the very beginning, when we launched on Indiegogo, we'd email people maybe once a week. Now we're probably emailing people once a quarter, which is really crazy for a direct-to-consumer brand. Like I, every, every direct-to-consumer brand in my inbox blows up my inbox like four times a week, like buy more of our shit. And you know the amount of sandal emails that I get from like my sandal company is ridiculous. Uh, mm-hmm. And so we email people only when we want them to take a very specific action. Um, and that leads to open rates of, you know, high 40s on emails, which is really, really stellar for, for open rates on emails. And we make sure that we use that wisely and we don't uh, over the day people. That's great. So what are your favorite channels right now? Like of everything that you just mentioned, is there any channel that you're maybe putting more budget into or that you're seeing higher success with? If I can find a ROAS that beats Facebook, I will pull all my Facebook spend tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but they're definitely the highest ROAS. Uh, branded search is obviously the thing that's going to be best in the long run. So we spend a lot of time building up our brand recognition um, with people and our brand affinity. Just earn media is really good too. We have a PR agency that we employ and we got, we got covered yesterday by the Daily Beast and um, we've been covered by Real Simple and Forbes and Apartment Therapy. We are in Apartment Therapy's Best of 2020 picks and uh, a lot of other publications. We've been on Today.com and Amazon gives us a lot of shout outs because of the philanthropy that we do. And so that's been really helpful to have Amazon as like a, a big partner in, in our PR and in our discovery and exposure. Um, so overall, yeah, I'm, I'm just really, I, I would say Facebook and Earned Media are probably the two biggest ones. And then I do love radio and podcast advertising, and I'm trying to figure out how to make that funnier for the listener. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm currently recording a few new podcast ads that I think are going to be really funny and not like in a really bad guy code, not funny at all way, but like actual bits on the radio. Oh, give me a bit. What are you working with? There's no judgment. Okay, great. 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 So <laughs> I, so I've got one that I think is pretty funny in like a kind of a meta sort of way where I want to go on a podcast and be like, hi, you know, I'm uh, like, you know, it's like, you ever heard the CEO of Harry's do his thing? Like, I'm not yeah. famous, but I'm the CEO of Harry's. So yeah. like, hi, like I'm, I'm Colin, CEO of Sheets and Giggles. That um, probably means nothing to you, which is kind of depressing. A little sad. We're, we're a young company. We're based in Denver. We, um, you know, we do, do some good stuff. Oh, we sell bed sheets. I should probably, should probably leave with that. Um, God, how does the Harry CEO do this? Um, and, and, and basically like go that and then like somebody yeah. in the background goes, 10 seconds, 10 seconds. And I'm like, yeah, we, uh, we sell, uh, you pull up this bed sheets. Um, they're sustainable. They're soft on the cotton. Go buy them. She's And like, that's the end of the, <laughs> end of that. And then, that's like, actually catchy. I like that. Cause you. if people are like, what is this dude going to say? And did he know he was recording? <laughs> and then I want to record like four or five versions of that, that run yeah. on different, different roles. And like, and basically it moves from like, okay, you know, like they gave me a second take. I got it this time. I'm Colin, CEO of Sheets and Giggles. Again, we sell bed sheets. I feel like that's obvious. Uh, maybe not that obvious. I don't know. Like, if it was just called like sheets without the giggles, it'd be a little more obvious. And somebody's like ten seconds. I'd be like, oh my god! Like, and then like get back into it again. And and so I think that like those little like bits and like the non sequiturs and stuff is like very much our comedy and and the trailing off and the tangents. And so I really want to write a few different bits like that that really flow with one another. Yeah, that that's pretty great. I can't wait to hear those on radio or other podcast ads. Do you ever feel like selling through humor like that 
could hold you back in a way. Cause sometimes I see some brands where like that's so much their angle that it kind of gets away from, you know, the product because they get so funny where you're like, wait, what are you actually selling again? <laughs> so like, how do you guys balance that to make sure you're still, you know, selling, but in an in innovative new way that's setting you apart from others? Yeah, it's actually a stellar question. I, I see that all the time when I see like an Instagram brand that's like just like pure, pure, pure funny without ever talking about their products in any way or ever talking about like the reviews or like the, you know, their sustainability is just like buy us, buy our shorts because we're funny. It's like, dude, they're polyester yeah. shorts. I'm not going to buy your polyester shorts because you're funny. Yeah. But like the thing that we do, I think is, that is not unique, but I think is smart is we basically let our reviews do the talking for us. So we always say like, we're not serious, but the sheets are. And that's kind of our, our mantra is like, we don't need to sell the sheets. Like our reviews sell the sheets, our stats sell the sheets. Like we, you know, the amount of water we save, the pesticides and insecticides we save, we plant a tree for every order. We've got 3000 reviews on our website, 4.8 stars, and we don't hide our one star and two star reviews like a lot of other consumer brands do. Um, we have 845 reviews on Amazon as of this morning. I check every single day. I personally, as a CEO, read every single review that comes in. We have a Slack plugin that pulls every single review and puts it in front of my face every time we get one in live time. You know, on Amazon, we're four and a half stars. On Facebook, we're 4.7 with 116 reviews, I think. And so, like, that type of cross-channel confidence in terms of review score is really important for the consumer. And then the sustainability, the planting of a tree for every order. We give you 10% off if you donate your old, old sheets to a homeless shelter. Um, we pledge 1% of our profits, time, products, and equity to local Colorado charities. We've donated $40,000 this year to Colorado COVID-19 emergency relief. Like the stuff that we do, I think really speaks for itself. And we don't have to really broadcast it and advertise it, even though I just obviously did. Instead, we just kind of lead with the humor and then let people read more if they want. And truth be told, I think the most limiting thing, and you kind of touched on this, is that not everybody's a reader, uh, especially mm -hmm. when you're talking about Americans. No offense to, you know, I'm a red-blooded American, but like we don't read. Uh, my, my old mentor at a, a toy company told me, you know, with the packaging that they made, they, their mantra is if, you, if you're asking people to read, you'll lose. And so that's probably the biggest limiter is that a lot of our, a lot of our comedy is very copy heavy. A lot of other people are more visual or meme based or, you know, slapstick and video and we're much more copy heavy. And so I, I like to think about us as sort of like a, the Seinfeld of, of betting brands, which is probably the first time that's been uttered uh, in the sentence. Was that your uh, tech stars, <laughs> like, you know, YC type of thing of, I am this or that? <laughs> kind of, yeah. When we went to tech stars, I, they were like, why, why should we have a betting company in tech stars? And my, I think I was just like, why not? And they were like, huh, oh, you're never in. thought about it like that. I was like, you're in. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I was like, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Seinfeld, the betting companies was, uh, was like kind of the way that I always thought about it. It's like, it's a, it's a brand about nothing. And by being a brand about nothing, it really is a wonderful way for us to be a brand about everything. And that was the beauty of Seinfeld, which is my favorite TV show, obviously, is that every episode was about its own little subtopic. and It didn't have to have this overarching theme or, you know, story arc. And that's great with us is one day we can donate $12,000 to the World Wildlife Fund to save koalas. Um, another day we can donate 40000 to COVID-19 relief. Another day we can donate thousands of dollars to Black Lives Matter organizations. Another day we can plant 20,000 trees for last year's orders. Like, and, and we don't have this kind of like overarching thing that we push on people. Instead, they can just discover it if they want to keep reading. And then we just try to make the copy entertaining for them to find their way through our website. Cool. Yeah, that, that's a good way to explain it. And yeah, it makes sense how you guys do it. So it is limiting though. Yeah. Not, not, it's, you know, when you're building a brand, you want 20% of people to really viscerally resonate with it. And 80% of people, you know, to either be meh or like react poorly to it. Yeah. And then that way you just don't want difference. That's the biggest thing is I see so many direct to consumer brands that are like the next shiny thing. Like, Oh, like the best apparel you'll ever buy or like the mm -hmm. best makeup or the best like food or like, they're all the same exact brand and it bores me to tears. The white stuff on the white walls with the white curtains in the white room. Like it's like, yep. oh, just kill me. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. So how do you encourage reviews? You were mentioning that you have a ton of reviews. Like how do you 
get people to follow through and actually take the time to give you reviews? Uh, we, again, brand about nothing. We uh, give two people who leave reviews free pizzas every week. Wait, what? <laughs> for like, for like no reason. <laughs> just, yeah, just like, like, it's just like, why pizza? I don't know. Pizza's good. Like, you okay. like pizza. Um, is, <laughs> so, uh, is it, has it does it have anything to do with bedding pizza? I mean, people eat pizza in bed, I guess. I guess, you know? yeah. Like, not so, on my nice eucalyptus sheets, so I'm not nah, going to. I mean, but you know, they wash real easy, so it's okay if you, if you, you know, spill any. Um, no, but it's, it's real. that's how we incentivize it is like, we, we just say, Hey, if you leave a review, you know, there's a chance that you'll get two free pizzas this week. And you know, who doesn't like free pizza? Communist, that too. Um, and so, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> actually, good. I think I actually, we say capitalist, that too. Um, and so, uh, we, uh, you know, we do bits like that and like this stuff like that, that like, I think really drives people into the brand and we get people who are like, you know, like this is insulting i'm a capitalist and i'm like it's a bit like it's just a joke, a joke. about like free pizza you know like yeah. um and uh and so yeah it's it's that's how we incentivize it mostly and then again really engaging copy the subject line is good we have high open rates on our review request emails we make it so you can leave the review directly in the email um oh, that's a good and we one. don't we, yeah we don't overpay for review software uh i can't stand the stuff that's like thousands of dollars a month like there's really good affordable review software out there. Okay, cool. So how did you think about moving on to Amazon? Because we've had a couple of DDC companies on here, quite a few, and it's been kind of mixed where, you know, some were very excited about Amazon. Some were like, oh, I pulled it off because it kind of watered down the brand and they could end up just copying us and making a white label. And so there's been a lot of mixed thoughts <laughs> around working with Amazon. So what led you to wanting to utilize their platform? Obviously they're featuring you and helping you guys. Like, what are your thoughts? Um, around having a DAC company on Amazon? So Amazon's been a real, Amazon is, is Amazon. It's the best partner you'll ever have and the worst partner you'll ever have and exists simultaneously in the same platform. And, you know, so the, that, and that's why you, you hear this sort of debate or dichotomy amongst founders where it's like, do you want to go on, on Amazon? And the pros, right, are that 54% of Americans, I think up to 60% of Americans now, start a product search on Amazon. They've trained the American populace to, when they're looking for a thing, go to amazon.com. Google has lost that battle. And so it's a massive channel that you really, uh, it's hard to avoid. The, you know, so you have discoverability, you have, uh, you know, channel, you can have channel dominance. Like if you rise to the top of search terms for a high volume query, you can just have rake in cash with no marketing spend whatsoever for years until somebody tries to come beat you. It's a really stellar platform. Uh, the negatives are, of course, that Amazon's extremely impersonal as a company. It's hard to get people on the phone there, although we do have account managers now. It is expensive. They take you know 25 to 30% margin share all in when you end up calculating all the fees from most companies. Um, which is a really, really difficult thing for a lot of small businesses to swallow. And then you wind up paying them more to advertise on their platform to give them money when you make a sale. And so they're, they're a really good partner in a number of ways. They do a lot of really great things uh, for their companies, especially their small business partners. But, you know, overall, it, it's a love-hate relationship for sure. Yep. And, you know, you can do one thing wrong and get your whole listing pulled. <laughs> and, and that can be really devastating too. So... Overall, for me, it's a no-brainer because more than half of your audience is starting a product search on a specific channel. Uh, you have to be on that channel, period, mm -hmm. end of story, even if you're only doing it for branded searches. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. So earlier, you're talking about working with PR firms and you know different efforts to bring new people, new customers your way. How do you guys have um, your backend set up to be able to handle fulfillments? Like, What does your tech stack look like to be able to handle any surges in demand? Uh, so surges in demand are actually difficult because we, you know, for, forecasting forecasting demand is extremely difficult. Forecasting inventory becomes extremely difficult. And then you put those two things together and you have to forecast the amount of people that you have working on your warehouse team at any point in time, which is extremely difficult. And so when it comes to surges and spikes, we, we use a 3PL, third-party logistics provider, to ship out all of our orders, both on our website and on Amazon. We do FBM on Amazon instead of FBA. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we are basically able to get probably 99% of orders shipped out within a 24 hour period. But when we do have, have big surges and big backlogs, it can slip to 72 hours because we are paying for that 3PL service. 
they have a finite amount of people that they forecast to work on their, you know, thousand brand partners that you that share the warehouse space. And it's a really good way to like lower the cost overall fulfillment from like a small warehouse operation if you're running it yourself because you're sharing that that square footage with so many other brands and you're sharing the labor with so many other brands. It's a pretty straightforward process nowadays in terms of hooking up a 3PL. In the beginning for the first six months of the company, uh, October 2018 through March 2019, I was shipping out almost every box myself along with a, a three-person team in Denver, Colorado. We had our own warehouse space. We had a thousand square feet. We were packaging. We could do like maybe 250 orders a day maximum. And we were just trying to burn getting through holiday 2018 on our own. Uh, it was crazy. It was so, so, so was hectic. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I shipped 3,000 boxes in like a three-week period at one point in time with my with the rest of my team like working eight hours, 10 hours a day in the warehouse and you know buy everybody lunch every day. And it was great. Uh, I had my customer service team in there working with me. It's definitely a lot easier when you can scale up and use a 3PL. I do know some companies that run their own warehouse space that actually wind up with all the headaches that it comes with and migraines that it comes with. They do wind up having a lower cost per unit in terms of fulfillment than we do. So there's certainly something to be said for that. But I think that right now we're at the 3PL stage for sure. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So we have not too long left. So I want to jump into the lightning round because I think you're going to have some good or funny answers. The lightning round is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud, our sponsors. They're amazing. This is where I'm going to ask you a question and you have a minute or less to answer. Are you ready, okay. Colin? I am ready. All right. The first one, what is the biggest fail that comes to mind when starting a DTC company that you experienced? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we are for our packaging was white in the beginning. Um, you were the I white wanted... walls, white sheets, white everything. Well, no, 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 no. no. The, the the inside of the packaging was purple, and the outside okay. was white. Uh -huh. And we and we you know our packaging is lovely. We've got knapsacks to wrap the sheets. We've got free eye masks in every box. Oh, nice. Uh, it's lovely. But a white exterior box sent through any postal service <laughs> is going to get absolutely destroyed. And so that was our biggest fail. Was we had boxes just showing up just beat the hell from FedEx and UPS. And um, and so we moved in, I believe, mid-2019 to purple exteriors. And that's allowed us to uh, be much more efficient with our shipping and, and have much better customer experience. That's good. Yeah, I can imagine getting a white box, knowing that my bedding is inside of it, being like, oh, oh, <laughs> so so dumb, so dumb. And, we, we, and, and so to protect them, we had to put them in poly mailers and in, and in brown cardboard boxes, which was a huge waste for the first six months of the company. Then we had people call us out on it. And I was like, you're absolutely right. This is so dumb. Why are we doing this? And so now we just slap a label on outside the purple box and it, it's so much better. Additionally, uh, minor thing, major thing, minor thing, we had plastic in the packaging for the first six months. We had a little plastic sheath around the sheets inside the knapsack to keep them safe from any water damage mm -hmm. uh, during transit. And we got a couple of complaints from people, really peaceful, nice messages saying, hey, I expect better from a sustainability company than to put plastic in the packaging, even if it's, you know, recyclable. And we said, okay. And so we removed the, the plastic and we put in tissue wrap now um, for a final piece of protection. So there's no markings on the sheets. And I'm thrilled to have eliminated that plastic. And now we've shipped out tens of thousands of orders since then with zero plastic packaging. In fact, we're the only bedding company in the world that does not vacuum seal our comforters and they ship in the box ready to go directly on the bed straight from the box. No plastic. That's a good one. I haven't even thought about that. And yeah, I was wondering like, oh, have you had any issues so far? But if not, more people should be doing that. Oh, we have issues. We just replace them. I mean, it's, it yeah. costs us money, you know, like we FedEx will rip a box and then it'll get damaged and they'll leave it outside in the rain and it'll get waterlogged. And like, so we definitely mm -hmm. have that. But, you know, I think it's worth it to eliminate the amount of plastic that we're saving. Yep, I like it. What's up next on your Netflix queue? Ooh, uh, I just started Ratchet last night. It looks too scary really for me. I'm a baby. <laughs> it, uh, you know, I, I like stuff like that. That's a little trippy. Yeah. Um, and I'm also a huge Marvel nerd, so I'm still waiting for the next Marvel series. But that's a Disney Plus queue. Uh, so I cannot wait for WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And The Mandalorian is in two weeks as well. So I'm really excited for that. Oh, you got your whole queue set up. I like it. I'm a nerd. Yeah, I love that stuff. Well, I know you said people aren't readers, but do you have anything that's <laughs> coming up on your reading list? 
Uh, yes, I just started the Everything Store. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yep, and I'm surprised I haven't read it yet, actually. Um, and then I I'm trying to read things from a different cultural perspective because I'm a you know 30 year old white male who mostly hangs out with other 30 year old uh, white males, and mm -hmm. so I've got a book called well-behaved Indian women that I just started and I'm really uh, enjoying it it's like a totally different cultural perspective I, like it's so foreign to me and it's really really great to immerse myself in that and uh, I'm trying good. to think there's anything else up next but those are the two big ones you have to try that out what new e-commerce tool are you trying out right now or having success with new e oh uh it's something called gives and okay. I should I should get a, a referral fee for this. Um, but there, <laughs> so basically, it is a really cool thing we're doing to allow people after checkout to when they buy something donate a percentage of their order to the charity of their choosing. So we just tested it uh, this week for Prime Day because we had our Prime Day deal on Amazon, and we we had a lower percentage off on our website, but you could donate another percentage of your order as well. So it actually ended up being a lower price, but part of that was donated versus just going into your pocket. And uh, it's really cool. So so our now our customers moving forward, and we're, and we're trying to decide if we want to do this on only special occasions or on everyday type of thing. You know, we already plant a tree for every order. Um, now we're going to be able to let our customers donate, you know, 10% or so of their order to a cause of their choosing, which I think is a really, really, really cool thing. Um, I just don't know if the dollars and cents work. And so we're testing it out to see what that looks like. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds like a good implementation. All right, the last one. What one thing will have the biggest impact on e-commerce in the next year? I mean, COVID. COVID. Uh, yeah. it's, it, no, no doubt. Um, it's blown up e-commerce on a you know five to six year type of acceleration. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the amount of people that are shopping online versus in store has just grown dramatically. And I think that we're probably in this environment for another six to nine months until a vaccine rolls out. And so I think that this will trend will only continue. And I think that that's been a, a huge, huge driver of e-commerce. And I think it's it's both good and bad, obviously. The, the It can be good for some industries and horrific for others. And so... It's also a logistics issue, and everybody listening out there, when you order stuff online right now, it's not the brand's fault if it takes 14 <laughs> days to get to you. If FedEx is trying to hire 70,000 people by Christmas, and I, they're not going to hit that. They're going to hit like 50,000, which is still a dramatic undertaking. Um, but the amount of packages going out right now is, is just overwhelming the systems that we built. Yep. Yeah, I completely agree. All right, Colin, this has been a fun interview. Where can people find out more about Sheets and Giggles and yourself? Uh, I'm a pretty private person. I do have a public Twitter, Colin D. McIntosh, uh, Sheets and Giggles. You can Google us. Uh, SheetsGiggles.com is the website. No and in the URL, just SheetsGiggles.com. And then we're also on Amazon. If you want to search for our sheets there, Sheets and Giggles, you can look the sheets. And yeah, I, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, and then our social media, Sheets Giggles, so just at Sheets Giggles everywhere on Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook. We're a good follow. We, we promise we don't just post pictures of our products all the time and ask you to buy them. And uh, we just had 10,000 followers on Instagram, which I'm really excited about. We're, you know, we, we've never paid for a single follower, so it's fun to build this organic following over time. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Nice work there. All right, Colin. Thanks. Well, thanks so much for coming on. This has been a blast and we'll have to have yeah. you on again in the future. Thanks so much for having me. Hopefully when I come back on next time, we're a much bigger company and everybody's like, oh yeah, I've heard of that brand. <laughs> they will after this. Don't you worry. <laughs> I hope so. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, you'll probably also love our e-commerce newsletter. To get it delivered straight to your inbox every week, sign up at mission.org slash up next in commerce. Up next in commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud and created by the team at mission.org. Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.